Hello, my name is Elaine Philippe Abels. I am the TAVI nurse specialist here at the Ottawa Heart Institute. I want to welcome you to our TAVI preparation and discharge planning educational session. You can choose to watch this video all at once, or you can pause and watch or rewatch one section at a time. Next slide, please. My role as the TAVI nurse specialist is to help coordinate and manage your referral and care for the transcatheter aortic valve implant procedure, or TAVI for short. This session is intended to provide you with more information and resources once you've been accepted for a TAVI. Please use the TAVI patient guide that was mailed to you as a resource throughout this video. This guide can also be found at our website at ottawaheart.ca. It contains all the information we are going to provide you with in more detail, and is a great reference throughout the TAVI process. There are areas to take notes in, and we recommend that you bring it with you to all your appointments. Next slide, please. We have a group of healthcare professionals to talk to you today. This includes a dietitian, a physiotherapist, occupational therapist, and vocational counselor, the advanced practice nurse in cardiology, and the advanced practice nurse in diabetes. Our goal is to provide you with more information to help you to prepare for the procedure and start planning for your discharge after the TAVI procedure. Hopefully, this will help you reduce anxiety, answer some of the most common questions patients have going through the TAVI process. Next slide, please. By now, you would have met with one of the physicians on the TAVI team and the procedure would have been explained to you. Almost 90% of our patients are able to have the valve implanted transfemorally through an artery in your groin. This following video shows the route the catheter makes and the valve being placed. As you can see, there's a wire that guides the valve being implanted. So we take very much uh, precautions and we're very careful as we advance the wire. On the left upper screen, you can see the aortic valve that's not moving very well, the stenosis that has occurred over time. Again, we're very careful as we advance the wire and the valve. Here we'll be just crossing the aortic valve as we continue to position the valve in its appropriate place. Very carefully selecting the location of deployment. Once we're comfortable with where we want to deploy the valve, you'll see that the old valve is just pushed to the side. It's not removed as the new valve is put into place. Hold it there for a second, a couple of seconds, and we start removing the wires and cables. Very shortly, you, you'll be able to see the new valve working as opposed to the old valve. And you can see here the new valve opening and closing. Perfect. So once again, you can see a healthy aortic valve closing and opening. And right below, we have uh, individuals with aortic stenosis where the valve is closing and opening very poorly. Next slide, please. We mainly use two types of valves uh, here at the Ottawa Heart Institute. The Edward Sapien valve on the left and the Medtronic Evolute R on the right. The team of doctors decide which valve to use based on your unique anatomy. If your doctor has explained a different route to you, please feel free to contact me for more if you have more questions. Possible risks and complications are explained in more detail in the TAVI guide, and your doctor will review them with you during the consultation and once again when you sign consent. Next slide, please. While you're waiting for the TAVI procedure, you'll be carefully monitored by the TAVI team. The length of time that you are waiting for a TAVI 
will depend on how urgent your condition is. Wait times vary and will be discussed with you when you receive your acceptance phone call. You'll be notified of your booked procedure a few weeks in advance, but final confirmation will take place the week before your scheduled procedure. Unfortunately, cancellations of procedures do occur to accommodate more urgent patients and other emergencies. We realize having your procedure date canceled is difficult for both you and family members. We will notify you immediately and reschedule your procedure for the earliest possible date. The waiting period can be stressful and it is normal to worry and have ongoing concerns. If you have any questions about the TAVI procedure or our wait times, please contact me during regular working hours. It is better to have your questions answered early than to wait until the morning of your procedure. Keep track of your symptoms during your wait as just the aortic stenosis progresses. Your symptoms such as tiredness and shortness of breath may worsen and you might find it hard to do your normal activities. If you experience worsening of symptoms, contact your family doctor and update me as well. You may need to be checked more frequently or have your medications adjusted. Call 911 or go to the local emergency department if you have shortness of breath at all times, even at rest, you start to have dizziness that is new, or if you are having fainting spells, you begin to have chest pain or discomfort that is new or unresolving. The use of nitrous spray will be discussed on an individual basis, but should not be used routinely in patients with aortic stenosis and no coronary artery disease. We're going to continue with our other presenters now. My contact information is available at the front of the TAVI guide and will be displayed again at the end of the video. Hello, uh, so my name is Kathleen Turner and I'm the dietitian in the cardiac rehab program at the Heart Institute and I'm looking forward to talking with you over the next few minutes about nutrition and your upcoming procedure, your TAVI. So I think the most important thing to remember when we talk about nutrition, and particularly when it relates to your upcoming procedure, is that now is not the right time to go on a diet. So we don't want you to lose a whole pile of weight really quickly leading up to your procedure. We wanna make sure that when you come in for your procedure, that you're well nourished, that you have good protein stores, and those things are gonna help you to heal once your procedure is over. On that note, if any of you have noticed that you're losing weight without trying, or perhaps your appetite is really poor, if that sounds like you, you should let your physician know next time you see them, or you can call the TAVI nurse as well, and they might decide whether or not you need to be referred to a dietitian. All right, so let's get into some of the things to keep in mind. So next slide, please. So the first thing to think about is that you want to try and eat at regular times during the day. So one of the reasons for this is that it's going to make sure you're getting enough to eat to keep you well nourished and to make sure that you're coming into that surgery with lots of good protein stores. So try to have something in the morning when you wake up within that first hour or two. So it doesn't have to be right away, but kind of within an hour or two and then every four to six hours after that. That's not a hard and fast rule. You might be someone who likes to eat every two hours or you might like to like to eat every seven hours, but you want to try and have meals at regular times so that you're getting enough to eat. Next slide, please. So part of that might actually be planning some snacks as well. So if you're somebody who never snacks, you don't have to start, but many people find that a snack can help tide them over between meals. And particularly for you leading up to your procedure, you want to make sure that you're having those snacks regularly to make sure you're getting enough to eat. Once you get home after your procedure, one thing that you might find is that your appetite isn't very good or perhaps your energy levels are poor. So eating really big meals might feel difficult. So having some healthy snacks available to you to eat once you're discharged can really be helpful. So think about some of the things that you like to eat and have those things around. So some good examples of different snacks might be a piece of fruit with a small piece of cheese or some nuts and seeds, maybe a hard boiled egg with that. So you wanna have some of those things available and think about things that might be easy to eat as well. So I'm gonna go on to our next slide. 
And the other thing to think about when you're, when you're planning those meals and snacks and thinking about what you're going to eat is to try and have a protein food at those meals and snacks. So this is important leading up to your procedure because getting enough protein is going to help to keep you in tip top shape so that you'll be able to heal well once you're discharged. And it's going to help you after your procedure to really help with that healing. So protein foods are things like meat and fish and chicken. It might be nuts and seeds, lentils, tofu, eggs. These are all good examples of some of these foods that you can try to include. You might also want to think about making sure that they're easy to eat, which brings me to my next slide, which is that you want to have easy to prepare foods available on hand. And not only easy to prepare, but easy to eat. So often we talk about having foods and having meals, people immediately think of these complicated things, but it's not the case. It could be something very simple like, you know, a sandwich or it could be a piece of fish, baked fish, frozen vegetables and some brown rice. It can be as complicated or as fancy as you like. One thing to keep in mind is that leading up to your procedure, you might be tired and fatigued. So you want to have things that are really easy to get ready. Same thing once you're discharged or after your procedure, you want to have foods that are going to be easy to eat and easy to prepare. So even things like um, puddings or yogurts, uh, those are easy things to eat as well. For some of you, either right now or after your procedure, you might find that you don't have the energy to prepare foods and you may need to have some prepared foods available. So there are meal delivery programs available in Ottawa. And if that's something that you need more information on, that is available on our website or we can get that for you as well. Um, you could ask uh, the Tavi nurse about that. So having things that are easy to prepare, thinking about whether or not you're going to need some support around those meals once you're discharged. Perhaps you have friends or family who might be able to prepare some of those meals for you or do some preparing ahead. So cook some things like soups and stews, have those available for you in your freezer that you can pull out once you're discharged. You also want to think about grocery shopping. So when you come home, you might not have the energy to go grocery shopping. So is there somebody in your life that might be able to help with that? A friend or a family member who might be able to pick up some of those groceries. So the next slide. You also want to think a little bit about uh, how much salt you're using. And we often use the term salt and sodium a bit interchangeably, but salt has sodium in it. And that's the piece you want to be aware of. So in a day, you want to have less than 2,000 milligrams of sodium, and a teaspoon of table salt has 2,300 milligrams of sodium. So it really doesn't take long to reach that 2,000 milligrams. The big thing to be aware of here is that most of the sodium we eat is actually in prepared and processed foods. So it's not necessarily the salt you're adding at the table or in cooking. So you want to use less salt at the table or in cooking, and also use less processed food. However, if your energy level is not, not very good and you find that you are buying more things that are prepared or processed, keep an eye on the food label. Look for things that have less than 8% daily value, unless you're buying a frozen entree and that's going to be your whole meal and then you want it to be less than 30%. So before I turn things over to our next speaker, I just want to kind of sum this up for you. So just remember, now is not the right time to go on a diet. You want to make sure that you're eating well coming into your procedure. Try to have regular meals. Make sure to include some protein foods at your meals and think a little bit about what kind of things you're going to be able to eat once you're discharged. And at that, I'm going to turn it over to our physiotherapist. Thank you, Kathleen. Hi everyone, my name is Regan and I'm a physiotherapist at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about what to expect from physiotherapy before and after your TAVI procedure. Um, next slide please. So um, I'll just give you an idea first of what we're going to discuss. So um, we're going to start with what you can do while you're waiting for your TAVI. Um, we call this the pre-procedure phase, so before your TAVI. And then we'll talk about the post-procedure phase, so after your TAVI, and what you can expect from your recovery. Next slide, please. So it is important for you to remain as active as possible in the weeks before your procedure. Now, we'll keep this within reason, 
But the better you are moving before your procedure, the quicker and easier your recovery is likely to be after your tabby. Keep in mind, exercise doesn't need to be strenuous to be valuable. And you don't need to have all kinds of fancy gear like these ladies do in the picture. The important thing is to not bring on your cardiac symptoms. These will be different for everyone, but they might include things like chest pain or angina, shortness of breath, fatigue, lightheadedness or dizziness or nausea. So please listen to your body. Next slide, please. Walking is one of the best cardiovascular exercises you can do, and that's whether you have heart disease or not. So our recommendation for you while you're waiting for your tabby is to try a short walk every day. Keep it easy and don't, and sorry, and do only what you feel is manageable without bringing on your symptoms. So think of it as maintaining what you've got, not training to improve. That part will come after your tabby. Next slide, please. So for some people, you may always feel symptoms when you walk or uh, you may not know how to recognize your symptoms or maybe you've never experienced any symptoms. So you might wanna consider chair exercises in that case. So you can march your feet while you're sitting, you can kick your legs out, even pump your ankles up and down. This will allow you to benefit from exercise but in a less demanding position. So it's easier for your heart. Next slide, please. So if walking for more than five minutes seems like a lot to you, then you might also want to consider an interval walking program, alternating short periods of walking and resting. Start with an interval of walking that you can manage. Maybe it's two minutes and follow it with one or two minutes uh, of rest. You repeat this pattern as many times as you're comfortably able. And you can always decide the number of minutes that best suit your ability. So walking for less or resting for more, whatever works for you. Next slide, please. Remember, your exercise should not reproduce your cardiac symptoms. So you should stop if you feel any of the signs listed here or any discomfort. If these feelings don't go away within a few minutes of rest, seek emergency medical services right away. So that means calling 911. Don't be afraid to go to an emergency department. Uh, by waiting to get any medical help, you're risking your heart disease getting worse. So if you are noticing any change in your symptoms, um, that's not as significant, but definitely noticeable, maybe they're mild symptoms that go away with rest, make sure you contact your family doctor um, as well as the Heart Institute Tabby Nurse Specialist. Next slide, please. So if you currently have any mobility challenges, we will arrange for a brief physiotherapy assessment in the pre-assessment unit or when you come into hospital right before your procedure. This will help our team to plan for your stay, making sure we have all the right equipment to help you get moving. This assessment would happen within your scheduled visit, so you don't need to worry about arranging it. Next slide, please. Another great way to prepare for TAVI is to practice deep breathing exercises. This particular exercise can be found on page 23 of our TAVI guidebook. And we're actually going to show you a video right now um, as a demonstration. So sitting up tall, but trying to stay relaxed. You can place a hand on your belly to feel the movement of your breath. We're going to inhale long and slow through the nose, as if you were taking a big slow sniff of your favorite flowers. You'll feel your belly rise out a little bit as you breathe in. And as you exhale slowly through your mouth, you wanna purse your lips as though you were blowing out candles on a cake. So you can repeat this exercise three to five times every day, but take breaks in between, uh, in between the breaths so that uh, you'll avoid getting lightheaded. You'll be asked to use this technique often in hospital following your procedure, as well as coughing strongly to help clear out your lungs. Next slide, please. So this breathing exercise is also a really great technique to use when you're feeling anxious or nervous. It can help distract you and calm you down. So we're gonna move on now to the post-procedure phase. So if I could see the next slide. 
Um, there are a few precautions to consider after your tabby. So it's recommended that you not lift, push, or pull anything that weighs more than 10 pounds for the first week after you go home. This is a precaution to avoid any pressure or strain you may put on the groin incision site, uh, as well as your new valve. You'll need to be cautious in your daily activities, especially with things like groceries or grandchildren um, and even pets. Next slide, please. We expect that you will recover your mobility gradually, naturally, after your tabby by moving a little bit more every day. If your care team notices that you're having trouble with getting up and moving around, a physiotherapist will see you and provide you with specific exercises and information to help you get back to your usual level of activity. But most of you will leave hospital without needing to see a physiotherapist and simply follow the exercises provided on page 23 of your TAVI guidebook. Do these exercises once per day, as long as you're not feeling any pain or discomfort. If any of these exercises cause or increase your pain, stop doing that exercise. Next slide, please. We also recommend a daily home walking program after your TAVI. This will be important for building your endurance. So plan to walk every day. Have someone walk with you for the first couple of weeks, but soon you'll be feeling confident to do it on your own. If your physiotherapist provided you with a specific walking program while you were in hospital, stick with that program when you get home. If not, begin with short periods of easy walking at a slow pace. Do what you can. Speed and distance are not important at this point. And keep in mind, we all have good days and bad days. Gradually increase the length of time you're walking when it feels good to do so. There's no need to push. Your goal is to eventually work up to 20 to 30 minutes daily of walking. But don't forget that everyone recovers differently and you should listen to your body. This daily walking can also be done using interval training as we discussed before. Next slide, please. And finally, you might consider joining a cardiac rehab program near you. A multidisciplinary team can help you achieve optimal heart health by addressing all the cardiac risk factors. There are programs all over the region and province that we can refer you to, including on-site, telephone, and virtual programs. If you're eligible to participate, we will reach out to you, but feel free to give us a call at the number here for more information. So thanks very much, and I am going to pass this along to our next presenter, Linda Vararis Brule. Hello, uh, my name is Linda Veraz Brule. I'm the vocational counselor and I'm an occupational therapist that work in the cardiac rehab program at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. And one of the important things to consider uh, both pre and post TAVI is managing your stress. And also we'll just take a look at day to day considerations post TAVI. Next slide. So managing your stress, uh, what you have here, presenting here, are the top 10 tips for managing stress. And you can find it on our, you'll, you'll see the, uh, the listing there, the link that you can take a look at. We have quite a few top 10 tips that you can take a look through. Um, managing stress is particularly important because what you'll notice is that stress is a normal reaction um, to challenging or uncertain, uncertain experiences. And certainly having a, uh, a, a procedure coming up or having a loved one with the procedure coming up can cause stress. So you should probably, it'd be normal to be experiencing some stress while you're waiting, waiting your experience. And so while this is happening, this is a great chance to try out some of these top tens. What you might notice is, uh, as Regan ha has already brought it to you, some things that you can do pro uh, pre tavi are also really good for managing stress. Uh, exercising regularly, breathing deeply. So breathing deeply changes how our body is reacting uh, 
uh, to stress around us and it actually works to calm us down and it, it very much helps us uh, with our overall heart health. And these are good things to do both as the patient or if you're a family member of the patient. You want to be aware of any sort of quick fixes and so that um, the tendency to, you want to make sure that you're practicing good heart health. So notice your thoughts and think about what's what might be causing your your thoughts and maybe talking with a friend might help if you do need you can reach out and we do have counselors here that you can speak to um, muscle relaxation is a great way of, of uh, decreasing stress in your body next slide slide please um, the other thing to do is recognize what you control, can control and what you can't. This is a tough one, but if you think about it, if you found yourself worrying about something, ask yourself, is this in my control or not in my control? And then that might help you decide whether, um, it, it's, whether it's something that you can do something about or, uh, or not, or try and, and let these go. Make sure that you take a break. Spend some time doing things that you enjoy and that you have fun. And it could be something as simple as listening to music, reading, uh, just a little bit of quiet time. Um, avoid exposure to stress. And sometimes this could be just as simple as maybe not watching as much news, uh, particularly before bed or anything like that, um, or distressing TV shows. Uh, at, at number nine here is evaluate your, your commitments and um, just sort of seeing what's available what's available to you. Okay, so it's important to set up a support network around you. It's recommended that we have, uh, you have someone at your home with you for the first week post procedure to help you out with activities. As mentioned before, you're not gonna be able to do as many heavy things. You're, you're gonna try, you'll be taking a little bit easier to begin with. So for all those really helpful people around you that say things like, what can I do to help? Here's a, here's a list of suggestions. So you can ask for things like help for meal preparation, help for groceries, pick up and drop off to appointments, um, people to spend time with. If, you, if you're the person who's in charge of helping and care of aging a parent, parents or maybe children, here's the time to maybe ask if someone else can do that or maybe help with someone taking care of your pet. Um, you're now going to get a break from light housekeeping, which is great. So someone else to do the dishes, vacuuming, this type of thing. And it's also a great idea to have friendly visits to reduce isolation and also a great stress reliever as well. Next uh, slide, please. So in, in some cases, you might be thinking, I don't know if I have all these sort of supports in place for the first week. So or you might be thinking, what could I do to, if, if I need uh, a little more help? Uh, you might want to consider spending some time in a, a convalescent home or also known as retirement homes as well. And one of the, th you could, one of the things to consider is uh, looking at the location of the residence. Often it's nice if it's already near where you live because that's usually where your neighborhood is, where your other supports might be might want to look at a co the cost. There's a, a large variety of different costs, um, the appropriate level of care. So depending on how much help you might need, uh, might decide what might be the best convalescent home to go to. Pet friendly, because again, pets, nice stress reliever, and a lot of them will allow you to bring your, your, um, your small pet with you. Whether there's availability, um, and if you have any special food preferences, you can check out with them as well. Next slide, please. Another thing that might be uh, worrying us and uh, a good thing to prepare for ahead of time is that where you can check for some financial things ahead of time before coming into into the hospital you can check things to see do i have insurance they'll be asking if you have insurance and that can be for things for covering um different uh, uh, room accommodations at the hospital if in the if it's needed uh that you need any sort of equipment afterwards and it's certainly isn't necessarily all the time but if you do checking your insurance to see if that's available uh, if you're worried about covering the cost of your medications, you can consider applying to 
the Trillium Drug Program, which is available um, to Ontario residents. Uh, you can also check the need for um, any other sort of supports. And you might want to contact your bank to discuss uh, POA or power of attorney options. And that's just so that if, if any sort of bills or things that come up while you're in hospital, there's someone who can take care of them for you. And it's much easier to take care of that ahead of time than when you're in the hospital. And next slide, please. And just to sort of wrap things up, what's very important, it, it's when we talk about our well-being and our, our heart health, uh, it's, it's important to look at all aspects of our health, and that includes our taking care of ourselves, our self-care. So consider how are you going to take care of your physical needs? Uh, uh, Regan has given you some ideas there of exercises that you're going to do. How are you going to take care of yourself that way, your uh, nutrition needs? What about your spiritual needs, um, your emotional needs, and your psychological self-care? These are all things that are a very important part of your health care. And don't forget, it's also an uh, important part of uh, if there's any caregivers that are listening to there, or even if you can reach out to people who will be your caregivers and tell them how important their self-care is to them as well. So um, thank you very much, and I send you off to our next presenter, Bonnie Quinlan. Hello, welcome. My name is Bonnie Quinlan and I'm an advanced practice nurse in cardiology. And I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so discussing discharge planning and what types of things we'd like you to watch for at home after discharge. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start by reviewing in more detail the topics that I'm going to be covering. Uh, what to watch for at home, signs and symptoms, uh, obtaining your weight every morning, medications, traveling and driving, preventing complications from dental work and also other uh, infections, and follow-up. Next slide. So I'm going to start uh, by talking about the TAVI Daily Weight Tracker Tool. And if you haven't received this um, tracker tool yet, you will receive one during your hospitalization. On one side of it is a calendar uh, looking document with boxes and the other side are green, yellow and red zones. It is important after having a new valve implanted that you are taking your weight every morning for at least the first month. Some of you may already be doing this as part of self-care related to monitoring for signs of fluid buildup. It's important that you're tracking your weight according to the instructions at the bottom of the calendar. So if you look under weigh yourself every morning in red at the bottom, it explains how to do this. You're empty your bladder first in the morning after you get up and then wearing the same amount of clothing you weigh yourself before you have breakfast. Please write that weight in the large box. The smaller box is for the date. Next slide. Now, after you have done that, please check the green, yellow, and red zones. And if you have one point in the yellow zone that applies to you, you should be calling our TAVI coordinator or the nursing coordinator. The numbers are on the far right-hand side. Now, I'd like to go through the zones in a little bit more detail. So the green zone is a good zone. Um, all, so you have no weight gain in the morning. No new swelling, no shortness of breath, no chest pain, you're resuming your normal activity, and your insertion sites are dry with no drainage or no new swelling. So on the far right, it just tells you just to keep doing what you're doing, everything is good. In the yellow zone, the first point says if you have a weight gain of more than two pounds in one day or more than five pounds in a week, you should be calling us. Uh, that that's a, a buildup of fluid that has occurred very, very quickly in a short period of time. If you have an increasing cough 
or an increasing uh, in shortness of breath. So if you're noticing that when you're getting home, you're becoming more short of breath doing the same activity, we need to know. If you're waking up in the middle of the night with shortness of breath, or you're using more pillows than normal to sleep with, that could mean there's fluid starting to build up in your lungs. And again, we should be alerted. Any increased swelling of your hands and feet or stomach bloating as well. The next two points refer to changes in your uh, insertion sites um, or where the doctors did the TAVI. For most people, it will be um, in the femoral artery and the groin sites. So if you notice the insertion site is more reddened or warm to touch, or it develops um, a new lump or starts to have some drainage that is not normal and we need to be alerted, we actually may want to have, bring you in and have a look at that or anything else that um, is unusual bothering you. The red zone, uh, that's obviously when you um, need to um, call, uh, be seen in the emergency department for sure. Um, and uh, any of those, any of those things, uh, make sure that you do go to emergency. Next slide, please. Um, so the TAVI guide and specifically the going home chapter is an excellent resource. Uh, the TAVI coordinator will have sent you a copy in the mail. It's also online for your reference. It's a good idea to review this chapter with your family before you come in for your TAVI. It provides you with a lot of useful information and it also gives you more detail about the yellow zone signs, such as the rationale of why it's important to weigh yourself daily. Next slide. Uh, you're also going to receive a prescription from your doctor at discharge. It will indicate any new medications, medications to continue from before your admission, and any medications to stop. Please ensure that you stop at your pharmacy or ask a family member to get your prescription filled on the way home. And on this slide, we have also added some helpful tips on how to manage your medications as well. Uh, very important that you um, utilize your community pharmacist. They have a wealth of knowledge on your medications, uh, when to take them, what times of the day to take with food, uh, what medications can be taken together and what ones not. They can also set you up with some really useful tracking systems uh, so that to help you remember how to take uh, your medications. Next slide, please. So antiplatelet medications such as aspirin and clopidogrel or Plavix make your blood greasy so clots don't stick to your new aortic valve. You may already be on these medications for other reasons such as having a stent in your heart artery. In the event that you are on a family of medications called anticoagulants or commonly re referred to as blood thinners, your doctor will decide which medications you should be on. Please don't hesitate to ask your doctor or healthcare provider before you leave if this is not clear. For any new medications, you, you will also see, receive um, additional information from your, from your pharmacist. Next slide. So we don't recommend any long distance traveling for the first uh, month after you've had your TAVI. In the event that you do have a trip planned, especially outside of Canada in the next few months after discharge, Please check with your doctor um, whether uh, they think it's safe for you to do that. And you should also check with your insurance provider uh, to make sure that you're gonna have medical coverage. As well, you'll be asked not to drive for four weeks after discharge. Uh, it's very common actually for patients to be asked to restrict driving after certain medical procedures. Next slide. So looking at complications from dental work, and again, there's a summary on dental care and preventing complications in dental, uh, from dental work in your, TAVI, in your TAVI guide. So please continue with good daily brushing and flossing of your teeth. This is uh, really important as it helps to prevent bacteria from getting into your bloodstream and possibly infecting your new valve. This is also the reason why antibiotics will be required uh, before all dental work, even um, dental cleaning. Your dentist or your family doctor can provide you with a prescription for that. For the first six months after your TAVI, do not have any dental work, and unless of course you do have a toothache or an abscess, then for sure you would be going. Next slide. 
So on the same theme um, re regarding preventing other infections, uh, your skin is a barrier, of course, against infection. Protect your skin by avoiding any type of uh, body piercing or tattooing uh, and paying careful attention also to cuts in your skin. Please contact your family doctor if you develop a fever, a cut that is looking infected, or any other in, uh, suspected infection, such as even a urinary tract infection, because you may need antibiotics. Next slide. Uh, for follow-up, we suggest that all of our patients at the Heart Institute try and see their family doctor, even by phone, within two weeks of discharge. You will have to arrange this appointment yourself or ask a family member to do so. Your family doctor is going to receive a detailed report regarding your TAVI procedure from us. You will also be asked to see one of our the TAVI doctors within four to six weeks. Uh, the, the TAVI doctor's office should contact you with this appointment. If you do not receive a call for the appointment within a few weeks of discharge, please feel free to call the office and just leave a message indicating that you haven't received this yet. Next slide. So we are also going to be calling you. You're, we are going to be continuing with our calls or emails, depending on what you have selected after discharge. You will likely have already received a call before your TAVI asking you questions about your quality of life. The next call you will receive will be about two days after discharge asking you questions about symptoms. Depending on how you respond, you may receive a call from a nurse to make sure that you are doing well. Calls after that will be 10 days after discharge, 30 days, and then six and 12 months after discharge. And i just like to reiterate, please never hesitate to contact us, um, the TAVI uh, coordinator or the nursing coordinator here 24 hours a day. We're always happy to hear from our patients. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Kim Twyman and I'm the advanced practice nurse here at the Heart Institute for Diabetes. Um, my role here is to, um, oh, I think we're good now. <laughs> my role here, sorry, is to um, help manage blood glucose control preoperatively while you're waiting for procedure and even while you're here in the building and after discharge as well. For those of you who don't have diabetes or haven't been told you have pre-diabetes, please don't tune out. Um, there's lots of information ahead in the next few minutes that you might uh, benefit from. Next slide, please. So why is glucose important? Glucose can affect every part of your body. Often people think glucose is tasty and shouldn't be an issue, but in high amounts, it can cause a problem. Next slide, please. So I know this slide is very busy, but what I wanted to introduce here was um, insulin resistance. So even before people are diagnosed with diabetes, um, the insulin in our body is intended to open up the cells so all of the cells in our body can use glucose. Glucose is the fuel for all of our cells. During periods of stress um, and as we age, insulin resistance occurs. Often with weight gain and unhealthy eating, we see an increasing amount of insulin resistance. With that, um, the glucose starts to build up throughout our body, but particularly in your heart vessels, it can promote further increase of lipid proteins and in increase the inflammatory uh, response on the heart arteries as well, contributing to plaque and um, atherosclerosis. So it's not just about the lipid story, but also the glucose and the lipid story. So even before you know you have prediabetes or diabetes, this can be rumbling along in the background. Next slide, please. So while you're here with us, or even before you come in, when you're having uh, your blood work done in advance, we're screening for diabetes. We're checking to see how much glucose has been circulating around in your blood. 
when we do a test called hemoglobin A1C. And if you have healthy hemoglobin, we're checking to see how much glucose has attached to your hemoglobin molecule. The hemoglobin molecule traditionally lives you know, for 120 days or so in your body. And if your glucose has been high circulating around, it sticks to it, kind of like the coating on a candy apple or the thickness of a coating on a Smartie or an M&M. So we measure that. And if you're sitting in the range of 6 to 6.4%, that's considered prediabetes. It's a good indicator that you may go on to develop diabetes if you don't take care, meaning you need to lose about 5 to 10% of your body weight and bump up your activity level and get back to eating healthy, especially while you're waiting for your procedure. Next slide, please. So for those of you out there who are already living with diabetes, we really want your A1C to be less than 7% before this procedure. We want those blood sugars to be between four and seven while you're home waiting for that procedure. If you're struggling and can't get them down to that target level, please reach out to your diabetes team in the community. If you don't have a diabetes team, please reach out to the TABI coordinator and we will arrange to get you connected with a, a diabetes team and get you in good control before your procedure. You can see the bottom range there, normal range, that would be for somebody who doesn't have diabetes. So for those of you who may have been told you have prediabetes, these are the targets you should be striving for. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to list um, these things, these items, these points um, going forward. I'm not going to go through each one, but certainly diabetes and cardiovascular disease um, is a huge problem in our building. About 60 to 70% of our folks do live with diabetes before they even come into our building, but another 15% are newly diagnosed with diabetes and approximately another 15% are diagnosed with prediabetes while they're here with us. Next slide, please. So again, another busy slide, but I just wanted to show um, all of the different parts in the body that contribute to glucose. Uh, contribute to sugar in our blood um, and also where it gets utilized too. So the positive signs are where the blood glucose is intended to go out and fuel and the negative signs are where we're seeing um, the cont contribution of sugar. So um, the reason why I prep wanted this slide is because the next slide we can move forward all of the medications that are available out there to lower glucose in our body target those different organs. And so it's not unheard of to have a number of medications um, to help look after your blood glucose levels. So don't be surprised if you get added medications while you're here with us. Uh, during periods of inactivity and increased stress, often more medication is required. And so you may see your medications increased while you're here with us or new medications added on. Um, I will focus on that one group there, the new SGLT2 group. Those are, have been shown to show great promise in uh, reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease and going on to develop heart failure. This class of, of drugs, unfortunately at this point, are still not available at the Heart Institute, but you will be referred to an endocrinologist post-discharge who will assess whether you need these medications um, once your procedure is done. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to comment on the pooped out pancreas. Um, having to go on insulin is not a failure of anybody's, and we use a lot of insulin in this building. During periods of stress, if you're not able to move the same way as you normally do and eat the way you normally do, and possibly be able to take the pills that you require, we may need insulin to get your blood sugars down to target where they're supposed to be. So don't be surprised if we do use a little bit of insulin while you're here in the hospital. And sometimes people do go home on insulin post-discharge as well. Often it's not forever once you get moving again and get back on your regular activity and, and healthy eating schedule, insulin can often be re reduced or even discontinued. And the next slide, please. I just wanted to draw your attention to a number of resources in the community while you're waiting for, for your procedure. 
Um, if you've been told you have prediabetes, the Ottawa Hospital has a special program called the Ounce of Pre Prevention where you can go and learn more about prediabetes. Um, and in the community, uh, across the Lynn and even in the outlying areas, there are diabetes education programs, either individual or group sessions that are available so you can learn more about how to get your blood sugars under control and how to live healthy with diabetes. So that's all I have to say. And if you um, need to learn more about diabetes, please feel free to reach out to the TAPI coordinator and they will get in touch with me. Thank you. Hey, uh, so that concludes this TAVI educational session. Please remember, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact me during regular working hours. If you have concerns during after hours, please contact the nursing coordinator at 613-696-7000, extension zero, and ask for the nursing coordinator. If you're advised to or are very concerned about your well-being, please do not hesitate to call 911 or present it to the emergency room. My phone number again is 613-696-7000 extension 18826. Thank you very much.